in our study now, we are going to take a look at Isaiah chapter 27. We started in our last presentation, but we want to review what we did in our last session uh, because uh, we need a little bit of context to understand what we're going to study in this session. It begins on page 183 of our study notes, and um, this period we hope to cover the entire chapter on Isaiah chapter 27. But before we do, we are going to do what we always do before we open the word, and that is to ask for God's blessing. Father in heaven, thank you so much for having been with us throughout the course of this study so far. We're dealing with uh, subjects that are rarely dealt with. We have so many symbols that must be interpreted in the light of the entirety of Scripture. And so I ask that as we attempt to decipher the symbol of Leviathan, that you will help us to understand what this beast represents and your final victory over evil. We thank you for giving us a clear picture in your word that you will prevail. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we began our study with Psalm 74. I'm not going to read the verses again, but I want to review the main points that we find in these verses. This uh, passage mentions this creature, Leviathan. We notice, first of all, that uh, the passage begins with a question. It's the same question that uh, was asked by Habakkuk. It begins by saying, How long will the adversary reproach and the enemy blaspheme God's name or character? So it begins with the same question as Habakkuk. Now, it also reminisces about the event at the Red Sea when God split the waters of the Red Sea. We also notice that the passage deals with the kingship of the Lord, of Yahweh, and his victory over Israel's enemies. We notice also that Leviathan has multiple heads. In Psalm 74, we are not told how many heads, but it does tell us that God is going to smash the heads of Leviathan. Now clearly this is not only talking about a creature that once existed. It is a symbol, even though this creature did exist at the beginning. This creature was created by God. Notice the statement that we find in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 51, which we read before. Uh, she wrote, with every living creature from the mighty Leviathan that playeth among the waters to the insect moat that floats floats in the sunbeam, Adam had converse with them. And then the final point that we noticed is that when God finally smashes the heads of Leviathan, he is going to feed him to the inhabitants of the wilderness or of the desert. What could that possibly mean if Leviathan is a symbol of an evil power? Now, we notice also that the earliest reference to Leviathan is in the book of Job. And you probably say, well, Isaiah is after Job. Well, yes, uh, Job, uh, Psalm 74, excuse me, is after Job in, in the canon. But actually, uh, in terms of time, uh, the book of Job was the first book that was written because it was written by Moses in the desert of Midian while he tended Jethro's sheep. Now, why does Job mention Leviathan? Why does the book of Job mention Leviathan? Well, you know the story of the patriarch Job. He basically lost everything that he had. He lost his children, his servants, his possessions, the support of his wife, his health, his friends, the nation turns against, turned against him and spit in his face, and it appeared from chapter 3 to chapter 38 that even God had forsaken him. And so Job felt lonely and forsaken by God. But finally God speaks to Job, 
In chapters 38 through 40, God asks Job a series of over 50 questions, and he describes in those questions the order of creation day by day. He begins with the light, the firmament, the green grass, the constellations, the birds, and the land animals. He goes through the days of creation in their exact order in chapters 38 through 40. And then God asks Job a very important question. He says, who are you to question the great God that created all of these things? And then in chapter 41, we find God showing Job a creature which instills fear. That creature is called Leviathan. And by the way, this is the first reference to Leviathan with regards to time. I know that Job comes before Psalms, but we need to understand that Psalms is uh, written long after the book of Job. Now, God asks Job the question, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? Or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many supplications to you? Will he speak softly to you? Will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him as a servant forever? In other words, he's saying, can you really defeat Leviathan? Can you gain the victory over Leviathan? Now, who is Leviathan? Well, we know who caused all of Job's problems in the Bible. Who was the one who caused all of Job's problems? It was a personage by the name of Satan, where we get the word Satan from. Clearly, Job 1 and 2 says that Satan was causing the trials of Job. Now, there was this creature, Leviathan, that was known by Job at that time. There's a very interesting book. It's the best book that I've read on the book of Job. Uh, it's called Job and the Devil, page 125, and it's written by Edwin and Mar Margaret Thiele. And uh, you, know, you can acquire this on Amazon. Uh, somebody shared with this with me uh, during the last class period. But the interesting thing is that in this statement, discovered way back in history, around the times of Job, a being by the name of Lotan was known to have seven heads and was to be the enemies of the gods. Let me read you just this one statement from the book Job and the Devil. A cylinder seal from Tel Amar, Tel means a mound, in Mesopotamia depicts a seven-headed dragon engaged in conflict with two deities, one before him and the other behind. Four of the heads, pierced by a spear, are shown drooping and are no longer in conflict. This shows that each head is wounded in succession. We'll come back to that a little bit later. But the other three heads are still erect, maintaining the struggle. Six tongues of flame shoot upward from the body of the beast. Now many other tablets have also been unearthed in the Middle East, where the gods are in conflict with a seven-headed dragon. In all these sources, the dragon is the supernatural enemy of the gods in a pagan world. Now, although Leviathan was created by God, like the serpent, it became a symbol of God's prime enemy. The description in Job 41 clearly indicates that this beast did not exist in real life in the days of Job. The depiction is symbolic. I'm not going to read the chapter, but I want to read the characteristics of this beast, of this Leviathan. Let me just say that you'll find many translations that translate the word Leviathan as crocodile. This is not a crocodile. 
because a crocodile does not have seven heads. And furthermore, the description is a description of a beast that is nondescript in that day. Here's the summary. Even the sight of Leviathan fills people with terror. That's verse 9. Leviathan has sharp and mauling teeth. That's verse 14. Now here's where we know that it's not a crocodile. He spews fire and smoke out of his mouth. That doesn't sound like a crocodile, does it? His heart is as hard as a millstone. That's verse 24. There is no weapon created by men which can fell him. Verses 26 through 28. He makes the sea boil. He fears absolutely no one. And here comes a key detail. He is identified in verse 34 as the king of the children of pride. Who are the children of pride? The wicked. And who is their king? Satan. Now interesting that after God shows the order of the days of creation, and after he shows Job Leviathan, and uh, Leviathan, you know, he, uh, Job knew about Leviathan, and God asked him, can you defeat Leviathan? Job now says, oh, I can't do that. And so now he's going to speak to God. Job 42 and verses 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything, including what? In the context. Not only that God is able to create everything, but God is able to defeat whom? Leviathan. That's right. And that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, Job says, by the way, some people think that Job sinned. Job didn't sin. He just spoke out of a lack of knowledge. He didn't know. What was going on? You know, it's easy to criticize Job. You know, all heaven knew what was happening, but the earth didn't. So he's puzzled. He never let loose of God. He was puzzled about what was happening to him because he knew that he had committed his life to the Lord and that he was faithful to God. And so he asked, why, why? He felt forsaken. If you think it's, it's a sin for Job to say, Lord, why are you not there? Then you would have to say that Jesus sinned when he said to his father, why have you forsaken me? He felt forsaken of God. So now he says, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? That God asked Job. Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. And then he says to God, listen please and let me speak. You said I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees. What does the word sees mean? Now I understand. Remember we talked about the eyes yesterday, the eye of understanding. And so he says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So that's the perspective of Job. It is an invincible creature, Leviathan. He breathes smoke and fire. He is invincible with human weapons, and he is the king of all the children of pride. But do we have any other pictures of Je Leviathan in Scripture? Yes, we do. We have a picture of Leviathan in Isaiah chapter 27, which is the little apocalypse that we are studying. As we noticed, 
uh, the book of Isaiah chapters 24 through 27 are describing events relating to the second coming of Jesus as well as at the end of the millennium. Remember we studied the, the two stages of punishment? So you have events not only at the second coming, but also events relating to the millennium. Now let's read Revel, uh, Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 1. Isaiah 27 and verse 1. In that day, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan. So what's going to happen after the millennium? God is going to punish whom? Leviathan. And what is Leviathan? The piercing serpent. So what is Leviathan called? The serpent. Even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Three names Leviathan, serpent, dragon. What picture begins to emerge in our minds as to who Leviathan represents? He represents Satan, the ancient serpent the devil, and Satan. Now, the picture of Leviathan is that he is the king of the waters. He is a water creature. He controls the waters. He controls all the fish in the waters, you might say. Notice Isaiah 17, 12, and 13, which we read before, and uh, we're going to read this from the King James Version. Woe to the multitude of many people, which make a noise like the noise of the seas. Let me ask you then, what do the seas represent? The noise, the waves of the sea, what do they represent? Multitude of many people. That make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. So the nations make a rushing like the rushing of many waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters. But God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. So what is the realm of domain of Leviathan the dragon who lives in the waters? His domain is multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples, which are, according to to scripture which are the children of pride over whom Leviathan rules. Isaiah 51 verses 9 through 11 refers to the same creature as Rahab and the serpent that God split apart when he opened the Red Sea. So is this talking about, is, is the Red Sea really a dragon? No, we're dealing with symbols here folks. We're not dealing with a literal beast. The beast is a symbol of a greater reality. Here the waters are compared to the body of a dragon that God will split or divide once more when he dries the waters of the river Euphrates. So when God dried the Red Sea, he was splitting the domain of Satan. And the same is true when he does that with the river Euphrates. The waters are divided, the waters are dried up, and what happens with Leviathan as a result? The Leviathan is thrown onto dry ground because he no longer has a water support. Are you following me or not? Notice what we find here in Isaiah 51 verses 9 through 11. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake, now notice this, as in the ancient days. Did we find that in Habakkuk where Habakkuk is saying, do what you did in the past? Absolutely. So it says, awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days. Do it again. In the generations of old, that is at the Red Sea. Are you not the arm that cut Rahab apart? What does Rahab mean here? It's the Red Sea, folks. The pagans believe 
that the seas were a real dragon, a literal dragon, but this is speaking symbolically. So it says, are you not the arm that cut Rahab, which is the same as Leviathan, apart and wounded what? The serpent. Are you not the one who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, that made the depths of the sea a road for the redeemed to cross over? So the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So what happens when God uh, smashes the heads of Leviathan? God's people can rejoice and sing. Did we find that before also in Isaiah chapter 25 and 26? You know, absolutely we did. Now you say, but that's kind of strange to, to speak about crushing the head of a beast. Well, where's the first time that you have in the Bible where uh, a beast's head was going to be crushed? In Genesis 3 verse 5. Is that talking about God, you know, uh, crushing the head of a rattlesnake? No. It's talking about God crushing the head of whom? And of Satan. The serpent is a symbol of Satan. We're dealing with symbolism here. Not like the pagans. The pagans believed this was literal. But the Bible teaches that we're dealing with symbols. Now let's notice Isaiah 27 verses 2 and 3. In that day sing ye unto her a vineyard. By the way, in the Bible, spiritual Israel is compare, compared to a fruitful vineyard. So in that day, sing ye unto her a vineyard of red wine. I, the Lord, do keep it. I will water it every moment, lest any hurt it. I will keep it night and day. God is saying, I'm going to protect my vineyard. And his vineyard in the Old Testament was Israel, but because they rejected the Messiah. You can find this in the parable of the vineyard where he sends out messengers to get the, the, the fruit. And what do they do? They reject the invitation. They kill them. Then he sends others, do the same to them. Last of all, he sends his son. They say, this is the heir. Let's kill him and take his inheritance. And then Jesus says, the kingdom will be taken from you and given to a people that produce the fruits thereof which is the Christian church. So now notice how Ellen White interpreted this, these verses from Isaiah 27. Of special value to God's church on earth today, the keepers of his what? The keepers of his vineyard are messages of counsel and admonition given through the prophets who have made plain his eternal purpose in behalf of mankind. In the teachings of the prophets, his love for the lost race and his plan for the salvation are clearly revealed. The story of Israel's call, of their successes and failures, of their restoration to divine favor, of their rejection of the master of the vineyard, and of the carrying out of the plan of the ages by a goodly remnant to whom are to be fulfilled most of the covenant promises. With whom are, is God going to fulfill all of his covenant promises? With a goodly what? Remnant. And so it says, a goodly remnant to whom are to be fulfilled all the covenant promises. This has been the theme of God's messengers to his what? To his church. To those who are occupying his vineyard as faithful husbandmen is none other than that spoken through the prophet of old. Now she's going to quote Isaiah chapter 27, verses 2 and 3, speaking about the remnant. Seeing ye unto her a vineyard of red wine, I do keep it, I will water it every moment, lest any hurt it, I will keep it night and day. Now let's go to verses 4 through 6 of chapter 27 of Isaiah. It speaks about two possible options that people need to choose from. God says, fury is not in me. 
Who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle? In other words, who's going to try and, and prevail in a battle with me? I would go through them. That is the briars and thorns in the vineyard. I will, would burn them together. That's one option. Now comes the other option. Or let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me and he shall make peace with me. He shall cause them that come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. What are the two options? The two options is to try to do battle with God. Who's going to win there? God is going to win. The other option is what? Making peace with God. And the promise is that Israel shall blossom and bud, this is not literal Israel, this is spiritual Israel at the end of time, and fill the face of the world with what? With fruit. Ellen White described in what sense God's people would be fruitful. What, what is the fruit that is spoken of here? Prophets and Kings 7.13 and 7.14. That which God purposed to do for the world through Israel, the chosen nation, he will finally accomplish through his church on earth today. So let me ask you, who takes the place of literal Israel? The church, spiritual Israel. That which God purposed to do for the world through Israel, the chosen nation, he will finally accomplish through his church on earth today. And now she's going to quote the parable of Jesus. He has let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, even to his covenant-keeping people, who faithfully render him the fruits in their seasons. Never has the Lord been without true representatives. Never has God what? Been without true representatives on this earth who have made his interests their own. These witnesses for God are numbered among what? What kind of Israel? The spiritual Israel. And to them we will be fulfilled what? All the covenant promises made by Jehovah to his ancient people. So who inherits, it's all, inherits all of the promises that God gave to Israel? The faithful in the church. The faithful remnant in the church. Now let's go to verses 7 through 9 of Isaiah 27. It's speaking about the time of trouble that God's faithful people are going to go through. Let me ask you, is it going to be a blessing for God's people to go through the time of trouble? If it's not a blessing, why does God allow his faithful people to go through it? Is it going to be a refining process going through the time of trouble? Will it make God's people totally unshakable and unbreakable no matter what happens? Absolutely. That's what God is going to describe now in Isaiah 27, verses 7 through 9. Hath he, God, smitten him, that is Jacob and Israel, according to the context, as he smote those that smote him, in other words, those who smote, smoke, uh, uh, smote Jacob or Israel? In other words, does God smite his people in the same way that Babylon smote them? No. Or is he, that is Jacob, slain according to the slaughter of them that are slain by him, that is by God? In measure, when it shooteth forth, thou wilt debate with it. He stayeth his rough wind in the day of the east wind. By this, therefore, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged. What is going to the time of trouble going to do? It is going to what? Purge the iniquity of Jacob. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, Ellen White says that going through the time of trouble will lead all earthliness to be consumed. As God's people go through the time of trouble, all earthliness will be consumed. Notice he doesn't say all worldliness will be consumed. 
She says, all earthliness. What does that mean? What it means, everything that attaches us to this world will be consumed. We will have no desire to remain in this world at all. It reminds me of Enoch. You know, Enoch is the proof that it is possible to develop a perfect character that does not sin before the second coming of Christ. Now, he sinned in his life because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But he gained victory after victory and eventually totally gained the victory over sin. And he was translated from among the living. The first person to go to heaven from among the living. Why? The Bible says that it's because he pleased God. Another place says he walked with God. What does it mean to walk with God? It means to behave like God. Walk symbolically in the Bible means to conduct yourself as Jesus conducted himself. He who says that he is in him needs to walk as he walked. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. And so the point came where Enoch was so close to God, so intimately related with God, that God said, Enoch, you don't have anything more to do down there. You're totally detached from the earth. Why don't you come up here and walk, me on the, walk with me in the golden street of Jerusalem? And so he was translated to heaven from among the living. Do you know Ellen White states, how many sins did Moses commit between when they left Egypt and when Israel was about to enter the promised land for 40 years? You can read the Bible record and not one sin that Moses committed is mentioned in those 40 years that he led Israel through the wilderness. And believe me, he had plenty of opportunities to lose it. Imagine pastoring a congregation of a million members, not counting women and children, who were constantly critical of him. We don't like the food. We don't have water. We're tired of the way. Constantly complaining. And Moses never lost it. He simply said, oh, okay, well, let me go consult with the Lord. He committed one sin. He had overcome sin. Do you know when he did that? When he was in, in, the, in uh, tending Jethro's sheep. He learned from the sheep. He did. And he unlearned what he had learned in Egypt. And Ellen White states in Patriarchs and Prophets that if Moses had not committed that one sin on the borders of the promised land, he would have been translated to heaven from among the living. There's a difference between dying and going to heaven and developing a perfect character and being translated to heaven. It is possible to overcome. It is possible to gain the victory. The problem is many times, you know, we consider ourselves holy. And we criticize those that are not as holy as us. That's one of the reasons why many people don't like to talk about a final victorious generation. Because those who say that they belong to the final generation, they, they say, you shouldn't be eating cheese. <laughs> you know, you shouldn't come to church dressed that way. Now, don't get me wrong. These things, we need to overcome these things. But what I'm saying is that we have a job to do on us before we try to straighten out everybody else. Correct? Well, you know that text where Jesus said, I can do most things to strengthen me. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I can do almost all things through Christ who strengthens me. Or the text that says, I can do all things except overcome sin through Christ who strengthens me. Strengthens me. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that means that you can overcome sin. And sadly, it's become unpopular in the Adventist church. And one of the reasons is because people who consider themselves super holy are critical of people who don't reach their level of holiness. Be concerned about your own life. I need to be concerned about my own life. But we need, this. We need to encourage the people and say, it is possible to overcome. 
but without being critical because those who live in glass houses don't throw stones. Now let's go back here. Has God smitten him as he smote those who smote him? In other words, has God punished Jacob the same that, he, that uh, the, the wicked Babylonians uh, did to Jacob? No. Or is he, Jacob, slain according to the slaughter of them that are slain by him? That is by God. And then it says at the end of this verse, verse 9, By this therefore shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged. And this is all the fruit to take away his sin when he maketh all the stones of the idol the, the context is idolatrous altar as chalk stones that are beaten in asunder. The groves and images shall not stand up. I like the translation in Isaiah 27 verses 7 through 9, the contemporary English version. It's clearer. It says, I the Lord didn't punish and kill the people of Israel as fiercely as I punished and killed their enemies. I carefully measured out Israel's punishment and sent the scorching heat to chase them far away. In other words, the captivity in Assyria. There's only one way that Israel's sin and guilt can be completely forgiven. They must crush the stones of every pagan altar and place of worship. That makes more sense, doesn't it? That translation. I like the New Living Translation as well. At the top of page 189. The Lord did this to purge Israel's wickedness. He allows God's people to go through the time of trouble to purge Israel's wickedness. To take away all her sin. As a result, all the pagan altars will be crushed to dust. No Asherah pole or pagan shrine will be left standing. There will no longer, God's people will no longer have idols. And by the way, our idols today are very sophisticated idols. One of them is the iPhone. Another is the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> or any football team that you're a fan of. Do we dedicate as much time to studying the Bible as we do to sports? That's a question that we need to ask. How much time do we dedicate to the Lord compared to what we dedicate to the venial matters of life? That's a question we need to ask ourselves. If we're dedicating far more time to the things of the world, we can't expect to have the character of Jesus Christ. We're going to be more like the world. Now let's go to verses 10 and 11. Isaiah 27, 10 and 11. Yet the defense city shall be desolate, and the habitation forsaken, and left like a wilderness. There shall the calf feed, and there shall he lie down, and consume the branches thereof. When the boughs thereof are withered, they shall be broken off. The women come and set them on fire, for it is a people of no understanding. Therefore he that made them will not have mercy on them, and he that formed them will show them no favor. It's talking about people who continue being idolatrous. And then chapter 27 and verses 12 and 13, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall beat off from the channel of the river unto the stream of Egypt, and ye shall be gathered one by one, O ye children of Israel. God is going to gather his remnant, and it shall come to pass in that day that a great trumpet shall be blown. What's going to happen once, when God gathers his people, his faithful remnant? What's going to sound? The trumpet. So it says that the tr great trumpet shall be blown and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria because they were taken captive to Assyria and the outcasts in the land of Egypt and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. So is God going to gather his people? He most certainly is. Obviously we were not captive in Assyria. But at the end of time, God's people will be captive by Babylon. They will be mistreated by Babylon. The prophet, once again, is writing in the context of where he lives. But these days, we need to, we need to understand that this is global in meaning. 
God's people are not literally captive in Assyria. They're captive in Babylon. And that's the reason why God says, Come out of her, my people. Now let's put the last piece to the puzzle here. The testimony of Revelation chapter 12. It's not until we get to Revelation 12 that we fully discern the true identity of Leviathan. Job helps us. Isaiah 27 helps us. Psalm 74 helps us. But the book of Revelation makes it absolutely clear who Leviathan is. Now let's work our way through Revelation 12 so that we can identify who Leviathan is. Revelation 12, 1 and 2 describes a woman who is in travail with a male child who is Jesus. As she is about to deliver the child, a fiery red, how many headed? Seven-headed dragon is waiting in the wings to devour the child as soon as the child is born. That's Revelation 12, verses 3 through 5. The enemy of the child is identified in verse 9 as the dragon, the ancient serpent, the devil, and Satan. The very names of Leviathan in Job and Isaiah. Does the book of Job identify uh, Satan by name in chapters 1 and 2? Is he called Satan? Yes. In Job chapter 27, is Satan referred to as Leviathan? Absolutely, yes. So there you have two of the names, Leviathan and you have Satan. But then we notice in Isaiah 27 that this being is also called the serpent and the dragon. That's Revelation chapter 12. So the very names that we find in Revelation 12 have already, we've already found in the book of Job, we've already found in Isaiah chapter 27 and Psalm 74. And remember the psalm, Psalm 74, actually says that Leviathan has many heads. Revelation tells us how many? Seven. Now let's continue our look at Revelation 12. After the child escapes the wrath of the dragon at birth, he grows up and is caught up to God and to his throne. That's Revelation 12 verse 5. That is the ascension of Christ to heaven after his victory. Now having lost access to the child, because the child, Jesus, grew up and he went to heaven, the seven-headed dragon launches a vitriolic attack against the woman who gave birth to the child. So are you catching the picture? Satan says, you know, I don't have access to the child anymore. He's out of my hands. He ascended to God into his throne. He beat me. He defeated me. So now I have to take second best. I've got to go after the woman. And so for a period of 1260 years, or days, which are years, for time, times, and the dividing of time, for 42 months, which are described in Revelation chapter 13, this dragon, seven-headed, spews water out of his mouth to try and drown the woman. Now let's notice something very interesting here. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12 just for a moment. It's an interesting little detail here. Are all the heads spewing out water at the same time to try and drown the woman? No. You see, the seven heads represent seven kingdoms that Satan has used to accomplish his purposes. And I believe that those seven heads represent, and I have a whole study on this, represent Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, the United States and Papal Rome restored to power after the deadly wound heals. So the heads represent the empires that Satan has used to try and destroy God's people and to accomplish his purposes. Now with this in mind, let's go to Revelation chapter 12 and let's read verse 
15. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 15. So the ser serpent did what? How many heads does the serpent have? Well, the serpent is the same as the dragon, right? So how many heads did the dragon have? Seven. Okay? So it says, so the serpent spewed water out of his mouth. Are all seven heads spewing out water? No, one rules at a, at, at a time. So he spews water out of his mouth. And what is the purpose of spewing water out of his mouth? Oh, it says, so the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. He wants to drown her with his waters. And the waters are proceeding from one mouth. Which mouth? The mouth during the 1260 years. At this point, the other heads are drooping. Remember the, what I mentioned from the book Job and the Devil? The other heads have already been overcome. They're drooping. But this head is spewing water out of the mouth. And by the way, this the head that during the 1260 years is pouring water out of his mouth, this seven-headed dragon, this Leviathan, this ancient serpent, whatever you want to call him, in Revelation chapter 13, that head receives a deadly wound. One head. In other words, what happens? The water no longer is coming out of the mouth of this dragon beast. But is its wound going to be healed? Of course. That'll be head number six. Or number seven, rather. Number six represents, I believe, the United States of America. So the seven heads represent seven empires through which Satan attempts to rule the world. Now let's continue our study here because there's a couple of things that we need to take a look at. Revelation 20, we're on page 190. Revelation 20, 1 to 3 and 7 through 9 and Ezekiel 28 verse 2 through 10 completes the biblical picture of Leviathan. Remember in, in Isaiah chapter 27 verse 1 it says that God with his sword is going to slay Leviathan in the sea. Now during the millennium the, is Satan going to have any waters that he can spew out? No, why not? Because all his waters are dead. Hello? He can't be spewing out any waters. He will have a deadly wound. All his people are dead. But is his wound going to be healed? Yes or no? Is the devil's wound going to be healed? Is he going to recover his power? Yes, he's going to recover his power. Because after the millennium, all of his waters are going to resurrect. All of his multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples are going to resurrect. Does he have his waters back? Of course he does. So what is he going to attempt to do? He's going to rally all of his waters to try and drown those who live in the city. By the way, is Leviathan still alive at this point? You better believe it. Does he have his power? Does he have his waters? You better believe it. And he rallies all of them. And the waters, so to speak, swirl around the holy city. They come from the four corners of the earth. Let's read it. Revelation chapter 20 and verses 8 and 9. Revelation chapter 20 and verses 8 and 9. It says there, verse 7, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. That's because his followers who were dead resurrect. And will go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners, corners of the earth Gog and Magog I have a whole study in this these study notes on Gog and Magog to gather them together to what to battle against whom against God and his people in the city 
whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Which city is that? The New Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now let's talk about the end of the millennium. At the end of the millennium, Satan will gather, will regain his waters from all human history. And all seven heads will be spewing waters out at the same time. By the way, this is spoken of as the eighth in Revelation chapter 17. At this point, Job 41 and Isaiah 27 verse 1 will reach its final fulfillment. The Lord will symbolically put a hook in his mouth. Fish him out of the waters. Will he be out of his environment? <laughs> will the waters support him now? No. Remember that, he was going, that Leviathan was going to give, be given as food to the people of the wilderness? That's not talking about literally them eating him up. What is it describing? They're going to dry up on him. And they're going to turn on him. To symbolically devour him. The multitudes. And so at this point Job 41 and Isaiah 27 verse 1 will reach its final fulfillment. The Lord will symbolically put a hook in his mouth. Fish him out of the waters. And slay him with his sword. And give him as food to the people of the wilderness. According to Ezekiel 28 verses 1 through 8, he will be eaten in quotation marks by the people of the wilderness but the, because the world is as a wilderness at this time. Ellen White described this in Great Controversy, page 672. He rushes. What is it that rushes? Waters, right? He rushes into the midst of his subjects and endeavors to inspire them with his own fury and arouse them to instant battle. What has happened immediately before this? God has shown the entire history of the world in panoramic view above the city. And they have seen that Satan is the culprit that which they did not understand before because Satan was working by stealth. He was working invisibly. So they, don't have, they didn't have the foggiest idea that they were instruments in Satan's hand because they couldn't see him. Because Satan was orchestrating the events from behind the scenes. But now for the first time in human history, the wicked will see Satan. And say, at first they're going to they're gonna go along. They're going to say, wow, yeah, look at all the people that we have. He seems to be, Ellen White says he's going to heal the diseases of the people. He's going to make the weak strong. I say, this has to be the prince of the world. But when they see the panoramic view, suddenly they look at Satan and they say, so you were the one, huh? You were the one that led us astray. Of course, we're guilty because we listened to you. We had a Bible. And we could, have, we could have seen that you were trying to deceive us. So we're not excused. But you are the one who started sin. And you are the one that has perpetuated sin. And so now, what are the wicked going to do? The wicked are going to dry up on Satan. And he'll become food for the people of the desert or of the wilderness. All of this is symbolic, folks. We're dealing with symbols. Now let's read, to close, Ezekiel chapter 28, where the, we find a description of what is going to happen with this being that had so much potential, with this Leviathan. Ezekiel chapter 28 Verse, verse 12 says, You were the seal of perfection, 
full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. He was the leader of the heavenly choirs. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth. In the midst of the fiery stones, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now let's go back to the earlier part of the chapter. Let's read verse 2. Under the symbol of the prince of Tyre, it says, Son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up, and you say, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God's, in the midst of the seas, in the midst of where? Where does Leviathan live? In the seas. And then God says to him, yet you are a man and not a God. Now, don't get all hung up by the fact that it says you are a man. Because in the Bible, angels are described as men. In Daniel, it says, that man Gabriel came to talk to me. So it appeared like a man. It says, though you set your heart as the heart of a God, Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. This is sarcasm. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasures. By your great wisdom and trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your heart as the heart of a God, behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They shall throw you down into the pit and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. What do the seas represent? The people of the wilderness. That's right. You will, you, will you say before him who slays you, I am a god, but you shall be a man and not a god, in the hand of him who slays you. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. Did you understand what we studied? Who is Leviathan? Satan. Who's going to win? God. God says to Job, can you defeat Leviathan? Job says, I know that you can do everything. And so God will gain the victory. God will prevail. Mm -hmm.